Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome and good morning. It is a beautiful day, a beautiful day. To, uh, each day that God gives me to wake up, I think, is a beautiful day. Uh, we just welcome you and thank you for coming to uh, join with us to worship together this morning. And for those who are streaming, we say welcome to you. And I hope this is a blessed day for each of you. Uh, may we stand together and worship singing, holy, holy, holy. song. Next we will have Ms. Cheryl, Mrs. Cheryl Tolbert, our children's pastor, to give us an update on what's going on in AMKM. And you may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, Alan Memorial. Cheryl Tolbert, your children's pastor here, and I'm so glad that you're joining us here in worship today. I hope that you had a great week. I hope you had a thankful week and that you had time to work on your thankfulness calendar. Even doing one or two days, I promise you, will make a huge difference. It does for us at dinner time. It focuses our um, discussion on things that we're thankful for, not on complaints or other things, but truly what we're thankful for. And I love these prompts because it gets us thinking about things that we wouldn't normally. So one of the days this week, Week, we were instructed to be thankful for something at our church. Now, I am thankful for a lot of things at our church. I love our pastors. I love our ministries. I love the people that attend. I just love everything about it. I even love our playground in the back. There's just so many things to love about Alan. But this week, I know I'm especially thankful for my missional community, my small group of women. There's five of us that meet every week at nine o'clock on Thursday. Now, right now we do that on Zoom and that's okay, but we always seem to make it. Um, we might have a baseball cap on or just um, fresh from a workout, but we still, we make it every week and I love it. This is a great group of encouraging ladies. We're, right now we're learning about prayer and we're encouraging each other and praying for each other every week. So that was definitely something that I was thankful for this week. Now, I wanna remind you that this week is 
is drop off week for Operation Christmas Child. So if you filled a box, make sure you check online for all the places that you can drop off your box. There are seven, I believe, in Salisbury. So you drop it off with your $9 donation and they take care of it for you and get those gifts going. Please don't forget that. It is really, really important this year. I've seen a lot of reports about the Christmas child boxes being a little lower this year because of all the COVID restrictions, but this is something you can totally do safely at home and drop off anytime this week. So I hope that you'll do that. Hey, I miss you guys. I'm so glad that all of our classes are back. I hope it stays that way. We are confident that it will. We're being safe. We're having a great time. Bring your kids back to church. I would love to see them. Have a great week. So moving. If you don't mind, may I ask if you are a veteran, would you raise your hand tall and proud in here? And there I see men and women. And thank you for your service. And we really do appreciate that. Today, uh, we're going to have one verse, and it comes from the book of Micah. And how quickly can you find that one in your Bible? It's going to be the book of Micah, chapter 6. Micah, chapter 6. And it's going to be verse 8. Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. And as we read through this verse, you may want to consider how the pastor is going to share with us what God has revealed to him through this pastor, uh, through this passage. Micah 6, 8. 
He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? May we bow our heads, please. Lord, thank you for these words. And first of all, thank you for who you are. Lord, we come this morning with hearts overflowing with love and honor and desire to worship you, to give you our whole heart. Lord, help us just be open today to receive from you. Help us not to be distracted and looking to the left or the right, but Lord, that we may lift up and look up to you, to receive from you today. Lord, I pray for our pastor. I just pray that you give him wisdom and, and holy courage to bring the words that you have assigned to him to share with us. And we will give you all the praise and the thanks and the glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Let's continue to worship together. If you'd like to stand, you may. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
The hostess at the restaurant ushered the couple to their favorite table where they sat down and ordered their favorite meal. After a few moments, the food came. They sat down and just engaged in some casual conversation. And as they began to eat, they looked out on the street and saw a most disturbing sight. A man in shabby, dirty clothes with hair that hadn't seen shampoo in months. And with thin, shaking hands, he held up a sign asking for money for food. Well, this was most disturbing to the couple. Here they were sitting in their favorite restaurant, eating their favorite meal, and down there on the street was this poor man begging for food, probably hadn't eaten in days. Something, something had to be done. And so the man stood up, pushed away from the table, walked over to the window, and closed the curtains. Not what God calls his people to do. Not close the curtains. No, God calls his people to walk with him. As the prophet Micah said, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. God calls his people to walk humbly with him which means to surrender to his will and to submit to his way and to live as he dictates. To walk humbly with our God. Not to do whatever we feel like doing whenever we feel like doing it, but to do whatever he wants us to do whenever he wants us to do it. To walk humbly with our God and when we do, our heart changes. And we love Mercy. What does the Lord require of you but to do, justice, to do justice and to love mercy? We begin to love mercy. We begin to have a heart that's compassionate like God's heart. A heart that cares and hands that help. When we walk humbly with our God, he leads us to the beggar on the street. He leads us to do justice. And what is justice? I'll give you part of the definition now. Here is justice, to do what is right for others. Especially the poor and the powerless. At its heart, justice is to care for those who have no social power. So the prophet revealed, and the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says, administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. The quartet of the vulnerable. The widow, the orphan, the immigrant, and the poor. God said, don't you dare take advantage of them because these people were very much powerless in that day and time. They lived on the edge of starvation. And God called his people to show them mercy because God's heart breaks. God's heart is filled with compassion for the needy and the defenseless. Hear the psalmist's description of our God. He remains forever faithful, executing justice for the oppressed. Excuse me, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. 
The Lord loves, protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. God defends the least and the lowest, those without power, those without riches. So too Jesus. We know that Jesus Christ came to bring salvation, but did you also know that he came to bring justice? Hear his proclamation of who he is to his hometown synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus' heart for the poor and the powerless shines through in his banquet instructions. Think for a moment, if it weren't for COVID, who would you have over, who you would have over for Thanksgiving dinner? Here's what Jesus Christ said to have over. Not necessarily for Thanksgiving, but for dinner. He said, when you give a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus Christ had such a heart for the poor and the powerless that he said that when we help one of them, we have helped him. So when we walk humbly with our God, he leads us to the beggar on the street. He leads us to do justice, to do what is right for others, especially the poor and the powerless, to live as Job lived. As many of you know, Job was an exceedingly righteous man who suffered exceedingly. And some of his not so helpful friends tried to explain it to him. Job you wouldn't be going through all this suffering unless you had done something terribly wrong. God must be angry at you. God must be punishing you, Job. And Job artfully defended himself. And he revealed, in so doing, the heart of righteousness in Israel. He first defended himself saying, I rescued the poor who cried for help. Job did justice. We need to do the same. Throughout this message this morning, I'm going to give you some action steps. So I hope you'll grab a pen and a piece of paper or the connection card or whatever you've got. Or if you're at home, grab a pen and a piece of paper. I hope you'll write down what these options are because this morning, I'm not interested in giving a lecture on, on justice. I'm interested that we do justice. So I'm gonna give you some steps today that will help you to do justice today before you go to bed tonight. I'm not asking you to do everything I suggest, but I am asking you to pick two that you can do today. Job rescued the poor who cried out to him. They are crying for our help too. We have talked about them for months. And many of you have already helped. Pastors in India who live off what their congregation can give them in eggs and milk and rice. But now the churches in India are closed because of COVID and because the churches are closed, the pastors receive nothing from their people.
I spoke the other day to Pastor Sian in India. He's like a bishop over about 25 pastors. And he told me the story of, of one man, one of the pastors who was on a conference call with them, who said, I had to send my family to live with my in-laws because I cannot feed them. But he stayed behind to care for the people of his church. But he has no food. The poor are crying for our help. Mountain villagers in India, who before the pandemic were among the poorest of the poor in India, but now things are even worse. Nobody can go out and get a job. There are no jobs. It's a pandemic. The poor are crying for our help. Lepers, some of whom are simply too sick to go sit on the street and beg for food. Like this woman who had this reaction when she received a little bit of food from us. Our brothers and sisters in India, our fellow Christians, think of 7 Eleven. Each, each month, the government of India gives each person in India under, who's living under the poverty level, they give them $7 and a five kilogram bag of rice, which is roughly 11 pounds. So if you're poor in India, that's what your government gives you, $7 and an 11 pound bag of rice. I asked Pastor Sian the other day, how long would an 11 pound bag of rice last a family of four? He said one week. So what are you going to do if you're poor in India and you have enough food for one week? What do you do the other three? Crying out for food. None crying louder than these in Pakistan. Slaves. Slaves who work 18-hour days in a brick kiln. Before the pandemic, they received one lousy meal a day. Now, during COVID, the meal is even lousier. I asked Pastor Shafkat, who ministers to these poor people, I said, what, what right now, what do they get from the owner? What do they get from the owner for food each day? And he said to me, two or three loaves of dry bread and some pickles. So let's just say that you're the husband and you're going to go to work for 18 hours and here's what you're going to eat for the day. This is it. You get one loaf of bread and a pickle. And your children and your wife, who work with you, get the same. Two weeks ago, three slaves died, in part because they didn't have enough to eat. Job said, I rescued the poor who cried for help. Why do I keep asking you to give to hunger relief? Because they keep being hungry. So action step number one, you know what it is. If you want to do justice today, give to hunger relief again or the first time. 
For when we, we walk humbly with our God, he leads us to the beggar on the street. He leads us to help the poor and the powerless. As we have since March, this month we seek to feed 750 very hungry families in India and Pakistan. You've heard the cries of these families for months. Let me add one more cry to the list. This story starts with a 12-year-old girl, Christian girl in Pakistan, named Farah. Farah was at home, minding her own business, when two men broke into her home and abducted her. Two Muslim men, one of them a 45-year-old man, 45 man named Kaiser. Witnesses say that Farah left the home screaming her lungs out. Kizar forced her to marry him. That's not marriage, that's rape. He forced her to convert to Islam. That's not conversion, that's coercion. And the father, Asif, struggles in his home to feed his other four children because his wife died four years ago. He struggles to feed his other four children and his father, elderly father, on his wages as a day laborer, $70 a month. You can do justice for this family. You can do what is right for them. You can give to pastor's discretionary fund. This is action step number two. You can give to pastor's discretionary fund. All of the money that comes into PDF next week will go to feed the family of this girl who is still living in sexual slavery. as the father continues to rescue her amidst death threats for doing so. Now some of you may want to do justice here at home to help the poor by giving to I Need. I Need is the fund that we use to help the people in our church, members and guests, who are in need. And yes, during this COVID time, some of them have hit hard times as well. But maybe you want to give more than your money. Maybe you want to give your time. You can give your time assisting with AMBC backpacks. Every week, a crew of people comes here to the building and they pack backpacks full of food for 100 needy children from Prince Street School so they have something to eat on the weekend. It's a marvelous ministry, but they still need volunteers to come and pack those backpacks. You don't have to come every week, but come when you can. Yes, everybody wears a mask. Yes, everybody tries to social distance. But if you want to do something in addition to giving money, you want to give your time Come and volunteer. Call the office. Go to ambc at almemorial.org. Email us saying, I want to help with the backpack ministry. When we walk humbly with our God, he leads us to the beggar on the street. He leads us to do justice, to do what is right for others. Especially for the poor and the powerless to live as Job lived. So Job's initial defense to his friends was that I helped the poor when they cried out. But he said more than that. I rescued the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had no one to assist him. Job said, I helped the orphans. I helped the little boys and the little girls who didn't have a mom or a dad. 
That too is what it means to do justice. Some of those slaves I talked about in Pakistan a moment ago, some of those slaves are orphans. They are little boys and little girls who live and work in that brick kiln without a mom and without a dad, and they get the same lousy food that everybody else gives, but they don't have anybody to comfort them, and they don't have anybody to take care of them, and they don't have anybody to hold them close at night. They just go to bed on the ground. And some of them die because of starvation, and they die because there's no medical help, and the owners throw their bodies on the ground and wait for the dogs to take them away. We rescue those children and we put them in Christian homes through your donations to defend and rescue. Another way to do justice. The God of justice calls his people to do justice, to do what is right for others. It is easy for us to become so wrapped up in our own life and in our own problems and our own issues that we don't hear the cry and we don't see the need. I will say, I think you're an extraordinary congregation. I think you're very giving and you have responded very well over the years to these kinds of needs. But it's very easy in our culture because we don't know. We don't know the needs. We don't know about slave children in Pakistan who are orphans. We don't know about all these needs. But it's so important for us as God's people to do justice, to do what is right for others. And the second aspect of justice, the second part of the definition, is to restore what is right for others. Justice is twofold. The first part is to do what is right for others. The second part is to restore what is right for others. If you see somebody being picked on, if you see somebody being abused, is it not your impulse to go and help the little guy? That's what God wants his people to do. There are people throughout the world who are being picked on, they're being abused by more powerful people. And God wants his people to restore, to step in and fight for them, to restore what is right for them. Job said, he went on to declare the rest of his defense, I shattered the fangs of the unjust and snatched the prey from his teeth. I shattered the fangs of the unjust and snatched the prey from his teeth. Job said, I confronted the powerful people who were hurting the little guy. I confronted the powerful people who were abusing the poor and the powerless. I stepped in, I smashed their fangs, I pulled the prey from their teeth. That's justice. That is to restore what is right for those who've had their rights taken away. In addition to Farah, there are four other girls who have lost what is their right. There are four other girls that we're trying to snatch from the teeth of the unjust. We've talked about Myra before, 14 years old, standing in the front yard of her home in Pakistan, Christian teenager, minding her own business, abducted by men at gunpoint, repeatedly raped by them. with the abductor giving the excuse to the court that now they were married and she was a Muslim. But by the grace of God and with the help of your prayers, we, they, rescued Myra. Now we must pray for her safety. Because 
they've had to hire security guards to be with her every day. Kenza, 15-year-old Christian girl who was on her way to church when the Muslim men abducted her. Same abuse and same lies. And she's still living in the home of her abductor as a sexual slave. Ladies and gentlemen, it almost keeps me up at night. And it makes me so angry. I have a daughter. Some of you have daughters. Can you imagine? Huma, 14 years old, abducted, now pregnant. Arzu, 13 years old, same horrible story of abduction and rape and terror and torture. Once again, these arrangements are not marriage, they are rape. These arrangements are not conversion, they are coercion. And if ever there were a cause that the Christian people around the world should stand up for and scream at the top of their lungs, it is this cause. Hundreds of these girls are abducted. Hundreds of Pakistani Christian girls and Hindu girls are abducted by older Muslim men every single year. And I know there might be something inside of us that says, well, well, pastor, we can't save them all. I got that, but I want to save as many as we can. And if it were my daughter who'd been abducted, I'd want the world to do everything it could. I'd want my brothers and sisters of Christ to do everything they could to help me get her home. To do justice is to restore what is right for others. These girls have a right to live free from sexual abuse. They have a right to go home to their families. They have the right to choose whether or not they will marry and who they will marry. They have a right to worship the Lord Jesus Christ freely. They have a right to be free. And you can help them. You can do justice for them. A few weeks ago, when I found out about our zoo, I just got distraught. I said, oh my God, literally, my God, another one. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me very powerfully and very clearly, and the Holy Spirit said, you're battle is not against those Muslim men. Your battle is against Satan. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. Your battle is against evil spiritual powers. You've got to form an army of prayer for it is through prayer that these girls will be rescued. And so I did and I said, Lord, how about a thousand? First I thought a hundred, I thought, no, my God is a big God. How about a thousand? A thousand Christians around the world who would pray every single day for the rescue of these five girls and the restoration of them to their freedom and their families. You might think a thousand is a ridiculous goal. Well, so far we have 405 in six nations, US, Pakistan, India, Spain, the Netherlands, and Moldova. Moldova, yeah, Moldova, it's a former Soviet Union country. I went there on a mission trip in 1998. The pastor there with others are praying. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to pray every single day for these girls and for their rescue. And I'm asking you to invite somebody else to do the same. It's called Save the Girls. So this morning, would you just complete the connection card? 
Put your name, your email, your phone on there, and write the words, save the girls. This is something all of us can do. We can all do justice for these girls and their families by fervent daily prayers. And I will keep you updated, trust me, on the progress and the needs. If you're at home, you know, just go to the home page of our, of our website, allenmemorial.org. You'll see where to sign up. Or you can go to a Facebook page, Save the Girls 2020, submit the form, sign up to pray. We ought to be able to finish out the other 595 prayer warriors just in this church alone. The God of justice calls his people to do justice. The God who sees these precious little Christian teenage girls being abused says no. And he calls upon his people to rise up and fall to their knees in prayer and do everything they can to fight this spiritual battle because it is a spiritual battle. We are fighting evil. God of justice calls his people to do justice, to restore what is right for others, to restore what was taken away from this Christian man in Pakistan on July the 1st, 2009. He was minding his own business, literally. When the man in the next business to him approached him about buying his shop, and he said, no, I'm not going to sell you my shop. So out of his greed and his desire for revenge, his Muslim neighbor made up a story that Imran had burned pages from the Koran. And he told everybody. And mobs came to the store and grabbed Imran and grabbed his father and nearly beat them to death, shouting, Christians are dogs. Imran is a dog. And with no evidence whatsoever, he was put into jail and then put into prison where he has been tortured for 11 years. Because he's a Christian. What can you do? Well, you got it. You got half of it. You can pray every day, as I do, for the rescue of Imran. I M R A N. You know, when he was taken, he was 26 years old, a young man. Now he's 37. His father died in that time. His mother died in that time. How do I know so much about him? I talked to his brother-in-law two or three times a week via text. You can pray. You can also sign. Today you can sign one of the letters in the lobby. The letters have English at the top and then they have his native language, Urdu, at the bottom. And they are, they are letters full of scripture. Scripture passages of encouragement. So what I invite you to do, and there are 25 different letters out there. What I ask you to do is to sign one of them and to write a message below, whether it's a scripture or a prayer or, 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 or draw a heart. I don't care what you do. He can read some English, but even if he can't read your English, he will be encouraged and uplifted just to see that you took time out to do a, a personal note to him, a personal touch.
imagine the comfort he will feel reading the letters from Christian brothers and sisters in America to know that he's not forgotten. The hostess at the restaurant seated the couple at their favorite table. They gave their order for their favorite meal. Then they sat back in their comfortable chairs and engaged in light conversation. Soon, their meal came. And as they were eating, they looked out the window over the street and they saw a terrible sight. There, uh, a man with, with shabby, dirty clothes and with hair that hadn't seen shampoo in months was holding up a sign with his thin, shaking hands that said, Money for food. Well, this is a terrible situation. I mean, here they are eating their favorite meal in their favorite restaurant, and down there on the street is this, this, this poor man begging for food he probably hadn't eaten in days. Something had to be done. So the man stood up, pushed away from the table walked outside, stuck next to the beggar and said, would you like to join us for dinner? Let's pray together. Lord, you inspired the prophet Amos to write these words. Let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Do justice through us, Father. Do justice through us today. I'll take a moment and think about the options I've given you today. And tell God what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I gave a lot at you in that message. I want to reiterate the action points that you could pursue. Hunger relief. Pastor's discretionary fund for the family of Farah. Next slide, please. Okay. I think I can remember them. I need, if you want to feed people in our church, A and B C backpacks if you want to volunteer to feed children on weekends. Defend and rescue if you want to rescue an orphan child from slavery. Save the girls if you're willing to pray every day. And you don't have to invite the world, just invite a few people. And the final one is pray for Imran and go sign a letter. So please think about that as we stand and we worship the Lord in song.
Thank you. Please be seated. As I do each week, I'll update you on hunger relief. Uh, we are in round five, um, step four. Um, God did a miracle last week. One person looked up and saw the amount needed, 3750 and he wrote a check for it. So that moved us right on to step four. Um, 3750 well, that's, that's last week, okay? It's 4000 about 4100 this week for all those lepers that I talked about, some of whom are too weak to beg. So let's pray together. Lord, your word's clear. The word you delivered in Psalm 82, verses 3 to 4. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy and deliver them from the hands of the wicked. Move us, O oh God, to, work, to walk so humbly with you that we defend the weak, the needy, the poor, the powerless. Help us as your people, O oh God, to do justice, to do what is right for others and to restore what is right for them. Give us your heart of compassion, Lord God. Hearts that care and hands that help. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.